Hi, welcome to Come Follow Me, week 14 of the New Testament. I'm in a little bit different location as I'm visiting with my mom for the next couple of weeks. Let's begin. We're in John chapter 5. After this, there was a feast of the Jews and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now, if you look at some of the original Greek Byzantine manuscripts, it says the feast, which implicitly meant the Passover. And in verse 2, now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. And if you look at the topical guide in your Bible, Bethesda, or house of mercy or house of grace, appeared to have some sort of medicinal properties attributed to the troubling of the waters. There was possibly an intermittent spring flowing into the pool, which produced a bubbling at the surface. Continuing on in verse 3, in these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. And then verse 4, you'll see that I have it highlighted because this verse is not actually in any of the original manuscripts either. It is likely addition from someone to explain why the water was bubbling. For an angel went down at certain seasons into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in, was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. From Bruce McConkie, we have the following. No doubt the pool of Bethesda was a mineral spring whose waters had some cure the virtue. But any notion that an angel came down and troubled the water so that the first person thereafter entering them would be healed was pure superstition. Healing miracles are not wrought in any such manner. Continuing on in verse 5, And a certain man was there, which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. And when Jesus saw him lie, and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he said unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? And the impotent man answered him, saying, Sir, I have no man, when the water is troubled, to put me into the pool. But while I am coming, and another steppeth down before me, and Jesus saith unto him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made whole, and took up his bed, and walked, and on the same day was the Sabbath. From Elder Bateman, just as the lame man at the pool of Bethesda needed someone stronger than himself to be healed, so we are dependent on the miracles of Christ's atonement, if our souls are to be made whole from grief, sorrow, and sin. Through Christ, broken hearts are mended, and peace replaces anxiety and sorrow. Verse 15, the man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus which had made him whole. And therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him, because he had done things on the Sabbath day. And Jesus answered them, my father worketh here too, and I work. Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his father, making himself equal with God. The idea that God worked on Sabbath was readily accepted because people were born, things continued to grow, the appearance of God was all around them. But when he said he was just doing what his father did, that really excited the multitudes and caused further persecution. From Elder McConkie, equal with God, awful blasphemy or awesome truth, one or the other. There's no middle ground, no room for compromise. Either Jesus is divine or he is blaspheming. Equal with God, not as yet in the infinite and eternal sense, but in the sense of being one with him, of being his natural heir, destined to receive, inherit, and possess all that the Father hath. Equal with God, not that he was then reigning in glory and exaltation over all the works of which his hands had made, but in the sense that he was God's son, upon whom the Father had placed his own name, and to whom he had given glory, honor, and power. Verse 19. The Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. For the Father loveth the Son, and showeth him all things that he himself doeth. And he will show him greater works than these, that ye may marvel. For as the Father raises up the dead and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. The Greek here, the original Greek, suggests to cause them to be alive. And so we see that Jesus is referring 
to the fact that he does whatever the father has taught him to do, including raising people from the dead. From Elder Jeffrey R. Holland, Jesus came to earth to reveal and make personal to us the true nature of his father, our father in heaven, to come to earth with such a responsibility to stand in place of Elohim, speaking as he would speak, judging and serving, loving and warning, forbearing and forgiving as he would do. This is a duty of such staggering proportions that you and I cannot comprehend such a thing. But in the loyalty and determination that would be characteristic of a divine child, Jesus could comprehend it, and he did. And then when the praise and honor began to come, he humbly directed all adulation to the Father. Verse 25, And verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. Now this cross references to Isaiah. And so I included one of the Isaiah passages here. Isaiah 24, 22. And they shall be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in the pit. And shall be shut up in the prison. And after many days shall they be visited. From Elder Christofferson. While yet in life Jesus prophesied that he would also preach to the dead. Peter tells us this happened in the interval between the Savior's crucifixion and resurrection. President Joseph F. Smith witnessed in vision that the Savior visited the spirit world and from among the righteous spirits organized his forces and appointed messengers clothed with power and authority and commissioned them to go forth and carry the light of the gospel to them that were in darkness. Continuing on in verse 31. If I bear witness of myself, my witness is true. This is the Joseph Smith translation, for I am not alone. There is another that beareth witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnesses of me is true. He sent unto John, and he bare witness unto the truth, and he received not his testimony of man. This is the JST again, but of God, and ye yourself say that he is a prophet, Therefore, ye ought to receive his testimony. These things I say that ye might be saved. He was a burning and shining light, and ye were willing for a season to rejoice in his light. So he's saying, not only do I bear witness of who I am, but John the Baptist did as well. Verse 36, but I have greater witness than that of John. For the works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do, Bear witness of me that the Father has sent me, and the Father himself which has sent me hath borne witness of me. Ye have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his shape, and ye have not his word abiding in you. For whom he hath sent, him ye believe not. Search the scriptures, for in them ye think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. And so he's offering further witnesses. The good works, the miracles, the signs that he gave them, the fact that the Father testified of him and the scriptures testify. Oftentimes we misunderstand verse 39. We think that it's Christ telling us to search the scriptures, but the original Greek is actually not that way. Many Jews in Jesus' day believed that merely studying the scriptures would allow them to receive eternal life. They failed to understand that the purpose of the scripture was to point them to Christ. He said, in essence, you think you have eternal life, but search the scriptures, for they testify of me. Verse 45, do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuses you, even Moses, in whom ye trust. For had ye believed Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if you will not believe his writings, how shall you believe my words? If you don't even believe Moses, who you revere, then how will you believe me? We're going to skip over to Mark 6 for a moment. And this is something that we've heard before. Verse 3. Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph, and of Judah and Simon? Are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. And Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, but in his own country and among his own kin, in his own house. And he could do there no mighty work, save that he laid his hands upon a few sick folk and healed them. This is one of the first instances where the Savior lays his hands upon someone to heal them. Verse 12, and they went out and preached that men should repent. And they cast out many devils and anointed with oil many that were sick and healed them. 
And then verse 14, and King Herod heard of them. And he said that John the Baptist was risen from the dead. Therefore, mighty works do show forth themselves in him. Now, this is kind of sprang ahead of everyone because John hasn't been killed yet. But then it goes back to explain in verse 16. But when Herod heard thereof, he said, it is John whom I beheaded. He is risen from the dead. For Herod himself had sent forth and laid hold upon John and bound him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. For John had said unto Herod, it is not lawful for thee to have thy brother's wife. From the Institute Manual, while visiting Rome, Herod Antipas became infatuated with Herodias, who at that time was married to Herod's brother Philip. Herod proposed that Herodias leave Philip in order to marry him. That being done, Herod Antipas divorced his wife to marry Herodias. Herodias and Philip, however, were never legally divorced. When John the Baptist condemned the marriage as a violation of the law of Moses, Herod had him put in prison. Now, you know the rest of the story. When the daughter of said Herodias came in and danced and pleased Herod and them that sat with him, the king said unto the damsel, Ask of me whatsoever thou wilt, and I will give it unto thee. And he swore unto her, Whatsoever thou shalt ask of me, I will give it thee unto half of my kingdom. And she went forth and said unto her mother, What shall I ask? And she said, The head of John the Baptist. Her stepfather, actually her uncle, was forced to comply, even though he didn't want to, because so many people had heard him and were witnesses to what he swore. And so he had John beheaded. From the Institute Manual, in the Gospel of Mark, John the Baptist's death is given more emphasis than his ministry. Mark recounted John's death between the accounts of sending forth the 12 apostles and their return. Another interruptive narrative or a Markian sandwich, like the account of the healing of Jairus' daughter, the effect is to underscore the potential cost of being a servant of God. Since John the Baptist was the forerunner of the Messiah, his death at the hands of wicked men foreshadowed the Savior's own impending suffering and death and illustrated the persecution and violence many of the disciples of Christ would eventually face. Mark 6 presents contrasting accounts of two very different feasts, the licentious birthday feast of Herod Antipas, which resulted in the death of John the Baptist, and the Savior's miraculous feeding of the multitude of 5,000. Thus a worldly king brought death, while the king of kings sustained life. Verse 31, And he said unto them, Come ye yourself apart into a solitary place, and rest a while. For there were many coming and going, and they had no leisure so much as to eat. And they departed into a desert or solitary place by a ship privately. And the people saw them departing, and many knew him, and ran a foot thereof out of all the cities, and out went them, and came together unto him. And Jesus was moved with compassion toward them, because they were as sheep not having a shepherd. And he began to teach many things. And when the day was now far spent, his disciples came unto him and said, This is a solitary place, and now the time for departure is come. That little part was from the JST. Send them away, that they may go into the country, round about and into the villages, and buy themselves bread, for they have nothing to eat. From Elder Bednar. Character is revealed, for example, in the power to discern the suffering of other people when we ourselves are suffering. In the ability to detect the hunger of others when we are hungry. And in the power to reach out and extend compassion for the spiritual agony of others when we are in the midst of our own spiritual distress. Therefore, character is demonstrated by looking, turning, and reaching outward when the instinctive response of the natural man in each of us is to turn inward and to be selfish and self-absorbed. Indeed, it is possible for us as mortals to strive in righteousness to receive the spiritual gifts associated with the capacity to reach outward and appropriately respond to other people who are experiencing the very challenge or adversity that is most immediately and forcefully pressing upon us. We cannot obtain such a capacity through sheer willpower or personal determination, 
Rather, we need and are dependent upon the merit and mercy and grace of the Holy Messiah. Let's look at John chapter 6, verse 5. And when Jesus then lifted up his eyes, there's a great multitude coming to him. He saith unto Philip, when shall we buy bread that these may eat? And this he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. And Philip answered him, Two hundred penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may take a little. Penny worth here is the translation into the King James English. But from the parable of the laborers in the vineyard, it would seem that a denarius, which is what the actual Greek was, was then the ordinary pay for a day's wage. So 200 penny worth would be basically two thirds of your annual salary. So what he's saying is if we had two thirds of the average person's annual salary, let's call that maybe $25,000, we wouldn't have enough to feed everybody. And you all know very well this story. So I'll just tell you briefly. They search around. They find a boy who has two small fish and five loaves of the cheapest kind of bread that there is. And the Lord takes it and he blesses it and he starts handing it out. He feeds the 5,000 men and their families, so at least 10,000 people. And then they gather in what's left over and there are 12 baskets of leftovers. From Sister Craig, have you ever felt your talents and gifts were too small for the task ahead? I have. But you and I can give what we have to Christ and he will multiply our efforts. What you have to offer is more than enough. Even with your human frailties and weakness, if you rely on the grace of God. Verse 46. And when he sent them away, he departed into a mountain to pray. And when even was come, the ship was in the midst of the sea and he alone on the land. And he saw them toiling in rowing, for the wind was contrary unto them. About the fourth watch of the night, he cometh out unto them walking upon the sea and would have passed by them. And when they saw him walking upon the sea, they supposed it had been a spirit and cried out. A couple of things that we should note here. Number one, at this point, the Sea of Galilee is about 10 kilometers across. And they have been rowing, according to the time here, for eight or nine hours and only were halfway across. So they were working hard and they were probably at the end of their rope when they see this figure walking on the water. Now, historically, according to the religion of the Jews, spirits could not walk on water. And so this couldn't have been a spirit. And yet they're so terrified, they think it's a ghost. From the ESV study Bible, when Jesus meant to pass by them, it was not so that they could fail to see him, in which case he would have stayed farther away from them, but so that they would see him pass by, walking on the water, thus giving visible evidence of his deity. The passage echoes the incident where God passed before Moses. The same Greek verb occurs in the Septuagint of Exodus 33, giving a glimpse of his glory. But it also echoes Job 9, where Job says that it is God who trampled the waves of the sea. The Septuagint has a Greek rendering meaning walking the sea, using the same words as Mark 6, and then also says he passed by me in Job 9. There is an implicit claim to the divinity of Christ's actions. So that the fact that he's walking on the water is a direct testimony that he is God. Let's skip over briefly to Matthew 14. We're continuing the same story, but from a different gospel. In verse 27, But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. And, and beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me from Charles Swift. The Lord's response is clear. Come. It is simple, concise, and direct. For me as a reader, it is also powerful, conveying a sense that the speaker can indeed make things happen by simply speaking. There is no uncertainty in that response. Jesus does not say, well, if you have enough faith, you can walk on water. Or if you have sufficiently prepared yourself, you can come to me on the water. Or if you are worthy, then it will work. Each of these responses would sow doubt in the heart of Peter. Also, each of those responses would reflect doubt in the heart of the speaker. 
implying that he does not know if Peter has enough faith or is prepared or is worthy. They are the kinds of things someone would say who does not have the power and authority, who is not sure if Peter can really walk on the water, even if he is called to do so. As this part of the story communicates so well, Jesus is not that kind of person. When he says the simplest of words, there is sufficient power for the most miraculous events to occur. Our desire should be to come unto Christ. If that is what we truly want, he will respond by inviting us to come. This is from Howard W. Hunter. It is my firm belief that as individual people, as families, communities, and nations, we could, like Peter, fix our eyes on Jesus. We too might walk triumphantly over the swelling ways of disbelief and remain unterrified amid the rising winds of doubts. But if we turn away our eyes from him and whom we must trust, as it is so easy to do, and the world is so much tempted to do, if we look to the power and fury of those terrible and destructive elements around us, rather than to him who can help and save us, then we shall inevitably sink in a sea of conflict and sorrow and despair. Verse 31. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? And when they were come into the ship, the wind ceased. 33. Then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, Of a truth, thou art the Son of God. This is, of course, reminiscent of when he stilled the storm. And they said, What manner of man is this? And now they have their answer. He is the Son of God. Now we're going back to, in the story to where the multitudes are following him. And in verse 26, Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Ye seek me not because ye desire to keep my sayings, neither because ye saw miracles, but because ye did eat of the loaves and were filled. That was from the JST. Verse 27, Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. Then said they unto him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? They're trying to get him to do another miracle, to feed them again. And Jesus answered and said unto them, The work of God, that ye believe on him whom he hath sent. And they said therefore unto him, What sign showest thou then, that we may see and believe? What dost thou work? Our fathers did eat manna in the desert, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not the bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. Again, they just want a free meal, and they're even trying to use the scriptures to get it. Verse 33, For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven, and giveth life unto the world. Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life, and he that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Verse 41, the Jews then murmured at him because he said, I am the bread which cometh down from heaven. And they said, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he saith, I came down from heaven? Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Verse 52. Then the Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, Except you shall eat of the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink his blood, you shall have no life in you. And whoso eateth my flesh, and drinketh my blood, hath eternal life, and I will raise him up in the resurrection of the just at the last day. The little last part was an addition from the JST. Now, they're purposely not understanding. The idea that Christ was the bread of life would have been reasonably easy for them to understand. He was born in Bethlehem, the house of bread. And the idea of being fed manna in the wilderness was a symbolism that they understood. But they didn't really want to understand. They just wanted to be fed. And so the Lord made it more difficult. And before even teaching them about the sacrament, or as other religions call it, the Eucharist or the communion, 
before he taught them about that, he introduced this idea of eating his flesh. And that really confused them. These things said he in the synagogue. I'm in verse 59 of John chapter 6, as he taught in Capernaum. Many, therefore, of his disciples, when they heard this, said, this is a hard saying, who can hear it? And when Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured, he said unto them, doth this offend you? From Eric Huntsman, the expression, a hard saying, has become a trope for any doctrine or practice that is difficult to understand, accept, or follow. Over the past few years, when I've asked my students, what are the hard sayings for them? Although they have mentioned faith issues and apparent historical problems, they have increasingly spoken about life's challenges, challenges that seem to call into question God's love for them, or struggles that they often feel they must endure alone, without the love and understanding of their fellow saints. Such hard sayings include gender disparities, sexual and other identities, and racial and ethnic discrimination. In addition, they include a challenge that is common to almost all of us, the pain of loss and disappointment, whether that comes from the death of a loved one, poor physical, mental, or emotional health, or lost dreams. Returning to the scriptures, verse 66, from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Remember previous, there were so many that were following, especially after the feeding of the multitudes, and they even wanted to make him the king. But now they begin to drift away. And then Jesus said unto the twelve, will ye also go away? And Simon Peter answered them, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. I want to wax a little personal here and tell you a story of someone I know very well who made some mistakes and was disciplined and lost his membership in the church. And as he was describing it to me, he said at the end of the disciplinary council, he sat down with the state president and the state president said, what will you do now? And his response was very much like what Peter responded to the Lord when he said, where else can I go? The church is still true. I'll just keep coming to church and work my way back. And I will add my testimony to his, that the church is true, that Jesus is the Christ, that contained here we have all the elements and the covenants and the things that we need to return to live with Heavenly Father. And that this life is a test and that we're here to experience mortality, to overcome these trials and tribulations that are here, and to return to him. And of this I testify in the name of Jesus Christ. Have fun studying this week. There's a lot more we could have done, but again, I'm trying to keep it down to 30 minutes and spend some time with my mom. Have a great week. I'll talk to you again next week.